Rewatch Podcast presents the Alien vs. Predator Rewatch. Join us each week as we discuss another film in the Alien, Prometheus, Predator, and Alien vs. Predator franchise. Send your feedback to the Rewatch Podcast at gmail.com. Join us on Facebook at facebook.com slash rewatchpodcast or follow us on Twitter at rewatchpod. Today we're discussing Predator, starring... Arnold Schwarzenegger, Carl Weathers, Elpedia Carrillo, Bill Duke, Jesse Ventura, Sonny Landham, Richard Chavez, R.G. Armstrong, Shane Black, and Kevin Peter Hall. Directed by John McTiernan. Welcome back to the Rewatch Podcast. I'm Corey, and this stuff will make you a goddamn sexual Tyrannosaurus, just like me. <laughs> and I'm Nathan, and you're ghosting us, motherfucker. I don't care who you are back in the world. You give away our position one more time, I'll bleed you. Real quiet. Leave you here. Got that? I reckon that was one of my better ones, man. <laughs> I'm not an impersonator at all, man. I don't rate myself whatsoever. But I was pretty happy with that. I have a feeling that motherfucker is going to be added more than once in this yeah. podcast. So I think this might be the first rewatch podcast episode I'm going to have to mark as explicit. Well, as I was going to say, we don't often swear on the show, but this one, it's going to be hard not to, eh? <laughs> <laughs> well, we're discussing Predator, so let's uh, start at the beginning and uh, check out the trailer. Let's do it. We are rescue team, not assassins. Now, what do we got to do? In a part of the world where there are no rules. We pick up their trailer, the chopper, run them down, grab those hostages before anybody knows we were there. What do you mean, we? Deep in the jungle, where nothing that lives is safe. You lose it here. You're in a world of hurt. Showtime, Jeff. Knock, knock. An elite rescue squad. You're bleeding, man. I ain't got time to leave. <laughs> is being led by the ultimate warrior. We need the best. That's why you're here. But now... Let's get Billy so spooked. There's something out there waiting for us. And it ain't no man. They're up against the ultimate enemy. Holy mother of God. Nothing like it has ever been on Earth before. She says the jungle just came alive and took it. We cannot see it. Blood, no bodies, we hit nothing. But it sees the heat of our bodies and the heat of our fear. Whatever it is out there, I killed Hopper. And now it wants us. It kills for pleasure. Ah! He was skinned alive. It hunts for sport. He's killing us one at a time. We're all gonna die. But this time, it's picked the wrong man to hunt. If it bleeds. You can kill it. Twentieth Century Fox presents Arnold Schwarzenegger. Predator. The hunt begins Friday, June twelfth at theaters everywhere. All right, welcome back. Shall we um, just get straight into some trivia, Corey? Let's do it. All right. Predator was released June 12th, 1987. So just to put it in perspective, we're jumping from Aliens, which we talked about last week, which was released in 1986, and we've gone ahead to do Predator now, which was released in 1987. And this debuted number one at the US box office in its opening weekend with a gross of $12 million, which was second only to Beverly Hills. Hills Cop 2 for the calendar year of 1987, which was a huge film. Now, keep in mind, too, the budget of Predator was 15 to $18 million, so a sizable amount, but 
also like compared to today's astronomical budgets it's reasonably modest the film actually went on to gross uh, 98 million dollars worldwide 59 million of that was actually taken from the US and Canadian box office and 38 million was actually made overseas so a big film wasn't it a good budget and uh, a good return at the box office worldwide the making of this film is actually really really fascinating I watched this great making of documentary on the definitive edition DVD that I own and the making of documentary is called if it bleeds we can kill it yep. and it is super interesting about you know what they went through to make this film and this was shot out in the jungles in Mexico and like all the actors were out there they did proper boot camps some of the actors are former Marines like Jesse Ventura Richard Chavez was in Vietnam War so these guys were out there and they were doing all this stuff yeah they do look like the real deal when they kind of out there I mean don't get me wrong I realize that they're all actors and they're acting but you're right that looks like there's a little bit of experience there whether it be Vietnam vets but the fact they're all big guys they all have like you know this screen kind of charisma that they look the part they feel the part you can kind of tell that they spent some time together before shooting and just with all the location stuff it it does look like it was tough wasn't it like like these guys were struggling kind of out there in in the jungle weren't they yeah it's crazy i mean just looking at the dudes they're all huge they're all buff but apparently this was really hard on schwarzenegger making this film you know he always had to have that mud all over him and everything it was cold it was wet and apparently he shivered like a lot yeah even when he would go and try to get warmed up under some heat lamps and stuff he couldn't stop shivering and this was taxing on even arnold schwarzenegger who was a professional bodybuilder man i know and that's saying something and puts it in perspective as well where this is actually the only film Schwarzenegger has made with um, Joel Silver who was the producer on this film and is is a very kind of well-known producer in his own right having made you know hundreds and well sorry dozens I should say of very well-known action films over the years and maybe that's saying something that perhaps Schwarzenegger didn't have the best experience like I know the outcome and the film is considered a modern day action kind of classic but yeah perhaps Schwarzenegger Schwarzenegger didn't have the, the greatest experience on this film. Apparently, in, in some of the trivia we found, he actually did miss his final wedding rehearsal at the time. He was getting ready to marry, uh, of course, uh, Maria Shriver. Yeah. He was on set filming this, and he apparently it just, like, ran over time, and he actually had to miss his final wedding rehearsal. So the other thing I found really interesting in this is that, you know, after Schwarzenegger finished his political career, right, he appeared in The Expendables. Right, which was uh, yep. you know a big collaboration of all these old action stars from the past, and they all came together and made these movies, The Expendables. It's funny that Schwarzenegger actually briefly, albeit briefly, worked with Jean-Claude Van Damme on this movie. Yeah, I know. He was originally cast as the Predator, and they had this gourd awful looking <laughs> outfit for the yeah. Predator. War. I don't know if you've seen the images of the original Predator concept, but oh man, it looks absolutely terrible and Jean-Claude Van Damme was in the suit now you know there's like conflicting stuff about what happened here some say he was too short and he was fired when they scrapped the original concept he's only five foot nine they ended up of course replacing him with Kevin Peter Hall who towers over everybody at well over seven foot tall yeah I know seven foot two according to the information I found yeah yeah. Yeah, and others say that Van Damme quit that he felt like he was just nothing more than a glorified special effect and wasn't actually doing any acting so still very interesting I actually found that very interesting in doing my research for tonight's show I had no idea about the Jean-Claude Van Damme thing did you or was that news to you I'd heard about it but you know of course I just I looked into it a bit deeper for uh, the purposes of this podcast the film wasn't actually called predator to begin with that was something that kind of came up in post-production if you actually look at the clapperboards on all the rushes the original title of the film was actually called hunter again it, it, like it would have been interesting if i mean the predator it's, it's such a great title it's, it's so classic these days and hunter doesn't quite have the same ring to it apparently there was another film made in the early 80s called hunter which they uh, wanted to like avoid sounding like so they changed the name to Predator at the 11th hour, which was fairly 
interesting stuff. It would have been a, a very different film if Jean Claude Van Damme was the the man in a suit, which I actually haven't seen those um th- those pre production photos of what the Predator originally was conceived to be. But I think it was a good move getting rid of Van Damme and getting Kevin Peter Hall, who was seven foot two, and putting him in the suit and 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 him enduring the hardships of actually doing it. Because as much as it may have been hard, the results are pretty damn great. Like the Predator itself looks great on screen. I think he does anyway. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And people who are early digital effects snobs in a way, like if you'd love to see how they film that stuff, finding out how they did the Predator when he's in camouflage mode is absolutely great. They make this shape of the Predator yes. that Kevin Peter Hall can wear, but it's bright red. Yep. Obviously, they can't do green screen or blue screen because they're in the jungle, so there's too much of that color around. So it's this bright red suit, and that's kind of how they outline the optical for it. It looks so fantastic, the final product. For 1987, man amazing. I know. Another thing I kind of want to bring up in the trivia is, do you remember a couple of weeks ago how we were talking about how Ridley Scott did the one-two punch of Alien and Blade Runner? Well, as much as that one-two punch is amazing and probably is hard to kind of top, people don't really think about it too much, but John McTiernan, let's not forget, he actually wasn't really that well-known a name prior to doing Predator in 1987. I mean, the only previous film that he made was a thing called Nomads in 1986, which I've never heard heard of but he made predator in 87 and then in 1988 he went on to do die hard and then in 1990 he did hunt for red october i mean those three films in their own rights are are, are nothing to sniffle at predator is an action classic and die hard is well we all know what that kind of started i mean both of those films are great films and the fact that he was able to kind of do that so early in his career says a lot about the kind of director that he kind of is not to mention that you got shane black here in the cast who is better known as a director and around this time the director of Lethal Weapon. So apparently the way that Shane Black tells it is that apparently they wanted him to come in and do a rewrite on the Predator script but the studio wasn't quite on the up and up on actually bringing him in to do it. So McTiernan said, well how about you come to Mexico with us under the guise of being an actor in the film. (laughs) And apparently, well, it never got around to having Shane Black do a rewrite on the script but he did remain as the actor playing the role of Hawkins of course. And uh, you're dead right. I never really thought of uh, Shane Black as an actor before. He has done a few things through the years, but nothing kind of all that memorable. I mean, he's more known as a writer. I mean, he, as you said, he wrote the uh, the Lethal Weapon, the original Lethal Weapon, which is, of course, directed by Richard Donner. But he, he wrote the, the, the uh, screenplay for The Last Boy Scout, uh, The Long Kiss Goodnight, Kiss Kiss Bang Bang. And then, of course, he went on direct to direct a few films as well. Most recent one being The Nice Guys, which is Russell Crowe and Ryan Gosling, if I remember rightly. Of of course, Kiss Kiss Bang Bang was his directorial debut, Iron Man 3, and it's actually just been announced that he's that they're making a film called The Predator. So he is directing and writing that film. I'm not too sure if it's a remake or a reboot or whatever. There's been some rumors going around the net that they're trying to lure Arnold Schwarzenegger back as Dutch back for that film. I'm not too sure if that has been confirmed. I don't think it has, but I think it's a bit of a nice rumor. Wouldn't you agree? Like it would be interesting to see Schwarzenegger back in that role, to see what he could kind of offer to that role. Yeah, yeah anyway, well, anyway. I, I agree. You know, it's sort of, you know, bringing back in some of those original elements from this film. So uh, I'm sure we'll talk about it one day. So <laughs> I look forward to it, actually. Oh, definitely, yes. This is something I found pretty interesting. Um, The body count. <laughs> this film I know this is kind of silly stuff but apparently 69 humans get killed in this film <laughs> one, <laughs> one scorpion one boar and spoiler alert to anyone that hasn't seen the film but one predator mm-hmm. so most of them at the hands of Dutch it's pretty cold isn't it dude like the violence a lot of people get offed especially in that scene in the middle I did want to mention the predator's blood as mm-hmm. well very iconic I mean especially coming from Alien as well the Alien Alien has very interesting blood, concentrated acid for blood. The Predator here, his blood is this fluorescent green. And I don't know, it's just, it's an interesting idea. And it is actually just a mixture of the glowy liquid you find in glow sticks mixed with some KY jelly. Yeah, no, no, absolutely. I, I think the 
the blood. It's an interesting kind of plot device, and they use it reasonably effectively, don't they? I think so. It's just that sort of that element that's just makes it otherworldly. Apparently, this is um Jesse Ventura's first role as an actor. Obviously, he kind of had a bit of a history in um, wrestling. He was a big wrestler, and obviously, he went on for a political career just like Schwarzenegger. But apparently, Schwarzenegger recommended Jesse Ventura for Blaine after inter- interviewing him for the role. He thought he looked the part and was big enough and had a deep voice and was manly. Also, to this another thing I want to mention too is that due to the health and safety regulations, Schwarzenegger was not allowed to light his cigar inside the helicopter near the beginning of the film. And it actually plays quite a big part in the film. The helicopter lands, everyone gets out, and then you see this like lone silhouette in the helicopter, don't you? And it's Schwarzenegger just sitting there like smoking a cigar. And I think it's hilarious that OHS got in the way of actually him smoking one and they had to add the glow of the uh, cigar in optically in post production. <laughs> <laughs> it's just around that time yeah. we're just like hey you know what maybe smoking is bad for your health yeah should we let our actors do it probably not yeah <laughs> Anyway, Bizarre. I did want to mention one final thing before we yep. uh, leave the trivia. But uh, I don't know if people saw this episode of Mythbusters, but they actually did try to see if covering yourself in mud would hide your body heat, and it does not at all. I know. Eventually, the mud just warms up to your body temperature. So, hey man, it's a, it's a cool plot point in the movie. Suspen- actually work. Suspension of disbelief. All right, I choose to accept what's happening, you know, on the screen. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> just go with it. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Let's get into it. Predator. Predator, yes. Man, this movie. I watched this like way before I should have. I watched this for the first time when I was like 12. You know, my parents were kind of cool with us just watching some of these action films when I was like a preteen and stuff. Like when I was really getting into the movies and stuff. Like I've always been a movie buff. So, I, you know, I have to thank my parents for letting me watch stuff like Predator. <laughs> but yeah, I saw it. I saw it way early. And I, I remember buying a two VH set yeah 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 predator and predator 2 when i was maybe like 14 or 15 yeah and i'd never seen predator 2 and i was like oh my god there's two of them oh, no, i can I watch know. the first one and the second one. yeah I, no i i saw this i've seen this so many times i can't this. remember when i saw this film probably my dad would have showed it to me and i think i would have been a teenager at the time probably not much younger and you know of course people my age we all watch these you know total recall predator terminator commando that that was staples of watching films films you know back back when i was a teenager and yeah i remember kind of this was this was definitely one i've probably seen this film at least a dozen times in 20 years at least every single time is always great it always kind of captures my imagination and i'm always kind of dragged into the the narrative so yeah i'm I'm looking forward to having a more thorough discussion yeah getting into it we kind of start off with this mercenary team sort of assembling if you were and we don't really get into them specifically it's more that the leader of these mercenaries guy named Dutch played by Arnold Schwarzenegger whose name is apparently Major Alan Schaefer I did not know that until yeah, getting into no, this discussion I don't think he ever gets called Alan in the film he might maybe early on possibly but it's always Dutch isn't it yeah and he meets up with I guess who is an old friend of his Dylan played yeah. by Carl Weathers yeah but it's a kind of he doesn't really expect to see him because I mean the way the film opens is that the helicopter is kind of flying in you kind of see this six man team landing on this unnamed beach and we've got as you say Dutch Schaefer and his six man team which ha- has Mac Elliott Billy Soul, Blaine Cooper George Poncho Ramirez and radio man Rick Hawkins and they're actually tasked by the CIA with spearheading the rescue of an official held hostage named Val Verde and he kind of meets up with this like a commander and they land and Schwarzenegger kind of or Dutch I should say meets this boss of the army unit to say you know Know, we're really glad you're here for this mission. And doesn't he keep referring to the hostage as like a, a cabinet minister? Is that right? Yeah, there's some sort of officials. They went down in guerrilla territory and we need a team to go in and get them from these These guys. mercenaries, that's right. And it's at that point where Dutch he meets Carl Weathers' character, who's not expecting to see. And the commander actually orders Schwarzenegger. He says, you've got to take Carl Weathers with you. 
you know, Apollo Creed on for the run and Schwarzenegger's not too happy about it at first because you can kind of tell, he goes, you know, we do things alone. We don't we don't work with people because you can kind of tell that the six-man team that he kind of puts together, he's pretty familiar with the guys that he's probably worked with for, for many years and I suspect they kind of do things their way. They don't really like being told what to do or being watched by the man, if you know what I mean. Is that is that a fair call? I think so, yeah. But Dylan is like super insistent about the whole thing and I guess he and Dutch have a bit of a history and it, it's not like Dylan's a slouch or anything. The two of them do this air arm wrestling. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's so right. Freaking muscle bound and sweaty. is like, <laughs> freaking men. Yeah. Oh my God. That's Dylan, hilarious. you son of a bitch. I know. <laughs> <laughs> but you can also kind of tell that Dutch is happy to see Dylan as well. Like, they're old friends. They kind of respect each other. You can tell that. But Dutch is clearly has his own way of doing things, and he doesn't really want to be interfered with or be told what to do or held up, for that matter. So it's with great reluctance that they accept the offer, but they, they, they soldier on with the mission, don't they? Exactly. So cut to it. They're in the chopper, and they're heading into enemy territory. Jesse Ventura's, like, chewing the tobacco, and Carl Weathers says, You've got a nasty have it there man <laughs> <laughs> nobody wants to uh chew this tobacco and he's like you know it's it's a cool little scene you know just a little tiny little get to know you kind of scene but really you can't hear too much of what's going on they're kind of just preparing for the mission and there's this uh the, the long tall sally's just blaring and isn't shane black trying to make like jokes and stuff with uh sunny badham's character and he doesn't yeah. he do like a really kind of bad taste insensitive kind of joke coming about a pussy or something like that yeah <laughs> he's he's quick with the pussy joke he's quick with the pussy joke and he's just trying to make everyone feel at ease and Sonny Badham just doesn't react even slightly to uh, Shane Black's kind of jokes and now keep in mind they also kind of frame Shane Black as a super geek with these ginormous 80s glasses which apparently Shane Black was very unhappy about wearing but John McTiernan was insistent upon that character being like this geeky kind of character for whatever reason so yeah so anyway yeah. So, so you're dead right they're on the chopper they're all kind of making small talk long tall Sally's kind of blasting in the background and they're heading to their first destination. The sound design for this is great because, yeah, you got that long, tall Sally blaring. They're approaching the drop zone and they shut off the music and that's when you get this, like, overpowering sound of the chopper whirling and they're ready to jump in Green Beret style straight from the helicopter down the wires into it. So you know these guys are an efficient team. Like, they do what... The, these are the best of the best at what they do. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And they look the part and they sell the part too. Like, I uh, particularly like Bill Duke's character. He's one of those actors that you may not know the name, but you certainly know the face. He's He's been around in many films over the years. He's been in all kinds of things. He was in uh, Battlestar Gal Galactica and Commando he was in. He was in Action Jackson, Bird on a Wire, Mel Gibson he was in. He's been in Payback and The Limey he was in as well. Various... Oh, he did film. an episode of Lost. Yeah, wow, he, he did too, this, you're right. Yeah, he played a warden character in the uh, Sawyer flashback episode. Yep, yep. But he's he's such a great character, actor. Like, he has this kind of line delivery. And the line that I actually decided on for the opening of this film is actually a Bill Duke character. And he does it in such gusto that you just, it's so memorable. I remember when I was watching it yesterday and that line came by, the first thing that popped into my head was, man, I'm going to use that as my opening line. <laughs> so, nice. I, thought, I thought it was great. But yeah, this movie is really efficient, you know? We, we get that opening scene, we're on the chopper, we're in the jungle, and then these guys are like stealth. Mm. And they just get in there and they get the job done and they quickly uncover these skinned corpses right by the chopper that they're looking for. Yeah, they don't quite understand exactly what's happening. They, they, they can't quite work out who would want to do this. It's a pretty bizarre way of killing people. And doesn't he find them like high in the trees as well? Like it's not at ground level. It's it's high in the trees that they're like strung up by their legs and they're skinned. And um, it's quite gross actually. But it's very ominous for our mm. team like we know these guys are good these guys are real good at what they do these guys that were skinned were trained army special forces guys they find the dog tags and they know you know that it's all like entrails all over the ground and stuff these guys were taken out by a precision hunter yeah and it wasn't it hopper doesn't he say isn't it like dutch always says that's hopper that's my friend hopper you know mm -hmm. and it kind of becomes a little personal i mean obviously it's going to be personal if anyone that's on their side gets killed but 
the fact that Dutch knows these three people, it, uh, it kind of escalates the stakes just that little bit more. Goddamn jackpot. This is more than we ever thought we'd get. Yeah, we got those bastards. We got them. I think this is what you're looking for. You sell sir! It's all bullshit. All of it. The cabinet minister, the whole business. Got us in here to do your dirty work. Look, we just stopped a major invasion. In three days, they'd have been across the border with this stuff. Why us? Because nobody else could have pulled it off. You pissed about the cover story. I knew I couldn't get you in here without it. So what story did you hand to Hapa? Look, we've been looking for this place for months. My men were in that chopper when it got hit. Hopper's orders were to go in and get my men, and he disappeared. He didn't disappear. He was skinned alive. And my orders were to get somebody, and who could crack these bastards? So he cooked up a story and dropped the six of us in a meat grinder. What happened to you, Dylan? You used to be somebody I could trust. I woke up. Why don't you? You're an asset. An expendable asset. And I used you to get the job done. Got it? My men are not expendable. And I don't do this kind of work. Yeah, and he starts sort of suspecting that Dylan knows something, right? Mm. And of course, Dylan's denying it. He says, I don't know why these guys were here. There's no reason for it. And then we get some great lines from Billy, who is their tracker. And he says, I don't know what happened here. There were some guys, there were some military issued boots, but whoever they were fighting, there's no tracks, there is nothing. Yeah, I yeah. cannot find anything about who they were fighting out here. Do we get glimpses of the Predator itself at this stage? We do. If I remember rightly, we definitely see some stuff like where they use that thermal kind of vision. And mm -hmm. you can kind of see that the Predator is like just lurking high above all of these guys and they, they don't really know what they're in for. This thing, you don't really see it, do you? I mean, it's all very well us talking from a perspective of having 10 films of Alien and Predator films. Us being so familiar with the mythology and how they looked but back then I mean we didn't really know too much about it it would have been a bit of a surprise and a bit of a shock in the same way that when John Hurt was lying on the mess hall table you know spewing up his guts whatever it might be and the thing bursts out of its chest and you see what they're up against and you actually go oh my god like it it would have been pretty shocking in the same way that Predator would have been shocking as well I mean maybe not as shocking but it's certainly trying to do like a similar thing isn't it and you know we kind of neglected to mention it but before we even get to that scene of of Schwarzenegger coming in on the chopper, there is just a quick throwaway shot of something flying in towards Earth and then some sort of capsule releasing from the main vessel yeah, yeah, yeah. and heading down towards Earth. So it sort of gives you that inkling that they're up against an alien of some sort. But I think if that wasn't there, you would be really confused about what's happening in this. Suddenly you get this, what they call the predator vision, this uh, you know heat-seeking uh, infrared vision. I reckon that single scene at the start of the film turns this from an action gorilla film into it's, it's, it's essentially a science fiction film, isn't it? Because immediately mm. you know that whatever they're fighting is from another planet or from not here or whatever it might be. You, you're really given zero information about anything to do with the Predator apart from the fact that a ship came into orbit, it dropped something and that something landed in Earth somewhere and you can only assume that these are skin corpses of this you know highly trained special forces team were killed by this thing because you're dead right, Billy has no idea why or how this has actually happened because there's no sign of anything and this immediately puts the whole team straight on guard and I think you can you can kind of feel the tension just immediately from that scene can't you it's just a, a complete sense of what the hell is going on here and they end up finding this uh, you know this insurgent camp of the uh, the gorillas that they they found the tracks of and they find that 
they have these hostages from the chopper. Yep. Just as they get there, they're all executed. They just have shots of them being shot in the head. So it's like these guys aren't even really that important. No. So they they take out the entire camp, <laughs> kill everybody there. It's, oh man, I mean, this is an action sequence. It is a great action sequence because it does turn a little bit into who are they killing and why are they killing them. It, it's just like a faceless kind of enemy, isn't it? And like there's that scene where, I mean, like, as I said to you before, like 69 people got killed in this film. Like that's a lot of people, but I, I'd love to know the record for Schwarzenegger films. Like I'm pretty sure Commando, more people die than this film, but in saying that 69 is pretty impressive and they're totally ruthless in taking down this camp and you can tell that they're pretty trained. I mean, Schwarzenegger, old Dutch, I should say, catches them all by surprise he lifts like a like a back of a truck and taking it off its stilts and it rolls forward going down the thing and it blows up killing like a mess hall full of people and then they just go in and they're throwing grenades and blowing everyone away i'm kind of glad because you know in commando i mean that movie is just one liner central Schwarzenegger has so many great one-liners in that movie, oh, yeah, yeah. but it comes off cheesy. Yeah. This one, he restrains it a little bit. You know, he does have that one where he throws the big ass Bowie knife in that one dude and goes stick around. <laughs> <laughs> you're like, okay, it's cool. You know, you expect Schwarzenegger to do it, especially around this period of his career. But you know, if he did that all the time in this movie, oh, man, it would just ruin it. Yeah, I know. There are a few kind of lines in in this film, but you're you're dead right. It's not every second. It doesn't rely on. It. I mean, you're right, there's a couple of things here and there, but it's, it's it's not over the top at all, and I quite like how the film kind of feels a little bit restrained, yeah? Yeah, exactly. And you know, it, it's good that Dutch manages to sort of catch on to what's happening here, because once they've taken out this camp, immediately he's just like, this is nothing. Like, what is this? You wouldn't bring us in for this. This is just a bunch of rebels out in the middle of the jungle. Like, this has nothing to do with anything. Yeah, yeah, It's yeah. like you said, they were, you know, just this faceless enemy who's expendable, and they're supposed to be. They these guys are nothing. The reason they're out there is definitely because of the predator. Well, Someone yeah, 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 yeah. higher up knows, just like an alien, the corporation probably knew when they sent an Astromo to find the alien. Somebody higher up knew something was going on in this jungle and they sent Hopper <laughs> and his men originally. How good how, this kid. <laughs> how good would it have been if Paul Reiser showed up in this film as the face of the company? <laughs> <laughs> Dutch. We're just going to get <laughs> Yeah, I've got to convince you, man. All right. No scientific testing. All right. <laughs> exactly. But you know, we don't get into that because of course the whole film is just set around being out there in the jungle and not being able to get out and having to fight the predator so it's kind of just that inkling that there was something going on they probably knew that they may have even known about the predator but you know we don't get any of that information in this but, movie we just you... know that our guys are in the middle of this shit and now they're gonna fight their way out yeah but you're right dylan actually confront is actually confronted by a suspicious dutch and he actually admits the mission was a setup to retrieve intelligence intelligence from captured operatives and that the dead unit disappeared weeks earlier in a failed rescue upon capturing a female gorilla named Anna, the group proceeds to extraction, unaware that they are actually being stalked by a nearly invisible creature using thermal imaging. I thought it was hilarious that scene where Dutch kind of confronts Carl Weathers and sort of says, you know, she's your problem, but you got to keep up. She can't kind of hold us back kind of thing. I was just like, she didn't really need to be there, truthfully. I, I didn't really think she really served much use. Other than sort of being able to sort of give us that exposition a bit later on, because <laughs> for the most of the film, she pretends not to know what yeah. Saying she doesn't know, she doesn't speak English. Then all of a sudden, she speaks perfect English towards the end. But we'll get to that. So Hawkins is actually chasing a fleeing Anna when they actually both suddenly confronted by the creature itself, and that's actually a bit of a cool scene because Anna is kind of running away and Hawkins is actually chasing her, and they suddenly get stopped by the predator itself, and the predator does something god awful to Hawkins, and blood splats all over Anna, and before you know it, Hawkins is actually actually pulled into the jungle by his feet, if I remember rightly. Blood everywhere, clearly dead. Anna is just totally stunned, doesn't really know what to do, and unarmed Anna is actually spared. Dutch then organises a manhunt for his body, during which Blaine is actually killed by the creature's plasma weapon, enraging Mac. Before we get to that death, though, there's actually a bit of an interesting kind of discussion where it really kind of escalates that they're being hunted by something that they're kind of unaware of, and they start realising that 
that it's in the trees, don't they? And Dutch is actually looking really closely at the trees and seeing what they can kind of see. And you can kind of tell that Sonny, Badham and Bill Jukes so kind of seem to know a little bit more kind of what's going on, don't they? Yeah, it's really cool. You know, they, they come across Anna there and she's just covered in blood. And Dutch is like, why didn't she escape? Yeah. Like, she's our prisoner. She should have just run away. And Poncho is asking her about it and she's just saying the same thing. You know, the jungle came alive and killed him, you know, as far as she could see. It was this invisible thing that just came out mm. of nowhere and killed him. And all that's left is some of his gear and a whole bunch of his guts just like <laughs> all over the ground which again they don't understand at all and it's at that at that point when Carl Weathers character Dylan say that the three guys their gear was left as well and why would they do that like like, like if, if, if you're being attacked by a normal enemy enemy you'd steal everything and, and run away There's, you wouldn't just leave stuff behind I mean, they can tell that whoever they're fighting which they clearly don't understand doesn't have the same motivations as the normal kind of enemy that they're used to so they're kind of placed in this reasonably perplexing situation, this highly trained military unit that is only used for kind of special ops. And they've been thrown in this fairly tough situation against the Predator itself. This is great because Blaine pulls out what he calls old painless, this mini gun that shoots like 3,000 rounds a minute or something yeah, yeah, yeah. like that. And of course, you know, he's like now heavily armed. The Predator takes him out with the plasma weapon that he has up on his shoulder, kills him, Mac comes in, sees Blaine dead there, picks up the minigun and just starts firing into, yeah, into the, the jungle. jungle. Yeah. Because he, he, he kind of gets a glimpse of the Predator and he's just blowing it away. <laughs> Everybody comes in on this gunfight and they're just all shooting their guns into it and they can't figure out what the hell has just happened. They say we're still in 2-4 and they can't risk coming in after us. The assets, Dylan. Expendable assets. It comes with the job. I can accept it. Bullshit. You're just like the rest of us. Shitload of good a chopper's gonna do us in here anyhow. Sergeant? Sergeant! Sergeant! Who get us today? I don't know. I only saw one of them camouflaged. He was there. Those eyes disappeared. What was that? Those eyes there. They disappeared. I know one thing, Major. I drew down a fire straight at it. Capped off 200 rounds in the minigun. Full pack. Nothing. Nothing on this earth could have lived. Not at that range. Nick, you take first watch. Then you get some rest. Ask her. Ask her what she saw. Ask her what happened to Hawkins. Go ahead, ask her. ¿Qué pasó hoy? ¿Qué fue lo que viste? Te dije lo que sé. Fue la selva que se lo llevó. ¿Qué más quieres que te diga? She says the same fucking thing. The jungle that came alive and took him. Billy, you know something. What is it? I'm scared, Pancho. Bullshit. You ain't afraid of no man. There's something out there waiting for us. And it ain't no man. We're all gonna die. No, it's totally driving them a little bit crazy. But in that attack by by Mac and, and the rest of the crew, I think they kind of injure the Predator slightly. And that's where we kind of get a first glimpse of the blood. It's during this time that I think the Predator actually kind of regroups. It runs away to kind of heal itself. And it's kind of sitting kind of obviously in the rooftops of the, of the tree somehow. And as it's kind of healing itself, it kind of lets out this awful kind of howl. And the rest of the team kind of all kind of look to the skies. Like, what was that? And is that what we're finding? and they all kind of get a little freaked out, don't they? So cool as well. Because, yeah, we still haven't seen this thing, like, front on yet. We've only seen it in camouflage, so it sort of decloaks itself. And you get a close-up of this, like, humanoid creature. It's got this weird skin, and it pulls out, yeah, this, like, medical kit. And it's got all kinds of, you know, scissor objects and 
you know, staples yeah. for stitching and all kinds of stuff. And yeah, you know, this thing is definitely alien, definitely high tech, and he is after this group. Yeah, I kind of, it's something that I wished a little bit more for. I don't really want to make too many complaints about this film, but one thing I will say is that the uh, the use of infrared, like you're right, like if it, it's very easy to criticize the special effects in this film, but they were pretty cutting edge for their day. So you really got to look, kind of look through it from that angle. I didn't really have an issue with that, but I wish they kind of rely on, like, I wish we saw more of the Predator itself, because you only really see the Predator for the last 10 to 15 minutes of the film, don't you? I mean, you see a glimpse of it here and there, but the whole suit, the design of it is so cool, and it looks great. I don't well, really... it's Stan Winston. Yeah, I know, but I don't really feel like they use the suit possibly as much as they could they used that kind of hiding in the shadows and that that weird effect that you kind of kept seeing in the jungle where you couldn't really see him but you could if you know what i mean they used that quite a lot and that wasn't quite as impressive as the suit itself again i don't really want to be too critical because i love this film but watching it yesterday i kind of wish for more predator itself and, and less kind of whiz bang special effects but that's just me but we do get a bit of information about the creature as far as what anna knows because she's lived in the region for a long time of course so they you know they discover that she can speak English and she sort of goes into like you know it blends into the environment like a chameleon and then she would say about you know when the hottest years would come around the men would go into the jungle and be confronted with this demon of sorts and they would start finding parts of the men or they would find them with their skins taken off and everything so you kind of get a sense that maybe predators have been coming down to this region for a long time and hunting one of the deadliest games of all yeah man. you definitely kind of get that impression that this is not the first time this group of people have had encountered this species and had these situations come to light you definitely get the impression perhaps it's happened in the past and so it's kind of interesting when you think about it like that because you, there's probably several different kind of events that may have happened during this period but yeah it's pretty interesting stuff everyone kind of gets knocked off like Mac and Dill and they all try to pursue the alien but eventually Eventually, the, uh, the alien kind of outwits and kills them both. Once this kind of all happens, Dutch actually sends Anna to the chopper alone and unarmed. Let's go. Ah. Billy! Billy, let's go! that the creature does not target unarmed prey because there is no sport in it. So I think that's kind of an interesting phrase to think about during the Predator. Like, the Predator's not interesting in just killing. He, it needs to be a game for them. It needs to be some kind of using their intellect to tr try and outwit, outlast, outplay them. And that's not me using that survivor term. I didn't mean to do that then, but that's okay. <laughs> I just did. So Dutch actually slides down a hill into a river and goes over a waterfall 
wall and ends up crawling through a patch of mud only for the creature to catch up to him and its cloaking device malfunctions in the water allowing Dutch to finally see his hidden enemy. That plot device is actually not very clear. Do you agree? In the film I didn't realise that his cloaking device malfunctioned in that moment. I just kind of thought he he was allowed to kind of show himself a little bit because it was maybe it was like a one on one situation. Do you agree? No I, I always got that that he came down in the water and you know it started to sort of go on the fritz a little bit and he, so he had to like turn it off but yeah I guess because of the fact that Dutch gets all the mud all over him and he's kind of there and he's thinking well this is it it's going to take me out but then it doesn't see him it's a good little device there to say okay he's figured out that this highly advanced hunter is using heat vision in order to find us yeah that's right and he's got the mud all over him and then you have that sequence too where preparing for the the, the predator's kind of ne- next attack Dutch decides that the only way to survive is to actually try and come up with some kind of method in, in bringing down the predator himself so he sets up all these booby traps for use of a better term but I can't really think think of a better one you kind of have this like 90 second kind of montage of him going around the jungle and learning that the only way in for the predator is through that way over there and setting up all these kind of you know booby traps that kind of come into play big time as the kind of the movie progresses yeah it's a cool idea actually you know because yeah sure these guys came in they've got their guns and that giant mini gun and everything like that none of that has worked the predator has taken them all out and even billy kind of just resigned himself to the fact that we're just going to die out here yeah and that's a, actually a great scene where he's just standing on that log and he cuts himself across the chest and pretty much saying just come and get me already so the fact that dutch has to revert to using the jungle around him you know he's, he's fashioning spears and putting logs up in trees and yeah, whatever yeah. to sort of you know get back to a baser element to try and fight this creature that has all this advanced weaponry it's an interesting face yeah off. he's uh, he's using those muscles to, to to good effect isn't he <laughs> you know there's, lots, <laughs> there's lots of like slow motion you know shots of him kind of pulling stuff up and this ginormous log that probably weighs you know 200 kilograms is, is being hoisted into the air. He's definitely a, a guy that can kind of just make stuff happen, yeah? Oh, man, this is where we get to, like, one of the most tense moments of the whole film. So he's got all these booby traps set up, and he lights this big fire, does a big primal yell trying to summon the predator towards him and he's got the mud all over him so he can hide yeah, yeah. and he's waiting and he's just leaned up against a tree waiting for the predator to show up and then it comes up right behind him in camouflage and everything and of course it doesn't realize he's there and it sort of just like strolls past him and he's like oh man this is so tense no it's crazy and obviously using his kind of preparations Dutch actually beats the alien at his own game disabling its cloaking device and, in- and inflicting minor injuries however the creature rallies at itself and finally corners him acknowledging dutch as a worthy foe the alien then discards its mask and plasma weapon and actually challenges dutch to a hand to hand fight where it has a clear advantage so this is where the film kind of comes alive a little bit where you kind of see you really do quite understand exactly what this creature is i mean it's a strange looking thing and i think the design on it is great i mean you can kind of see why alien versus predator hit each other yeah it's a cool thing too because it's like we were saying like for the most part of the movie you don't see the predator you see like what it sees with the heat vision and then you get glimpses of it camouflaged and then even smaller glimpses of it out of camouflage but then when it confronts dutch at this moment it's been wearing this mask the whole time and it sort of just unplugs all these like so like uh, devices yeah yeah devices the breathing apparatuses or something and takes the mask off and reveals this hideous face with these mandibles and weird dreadlock hair and everything such a bizarre creature and of course it's a massive thing that just towers over Schwarzenegger and just oh, yeah, like yeah 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 man this thing is tough i know it's crazy isn't it after being brutally beaten dutch actually narrowly defeats the creature by using one of the booby traps that he set up earlier in the film to crush it like he realizes you know he's cornered but he's kind of got this you know last card to play and, and the the predator standing there he releases the trap and this thing falls down on top of him standing over the crippled alien at the end of the film he actually asks what the hell are you but the creature simply repeats back what the hell are you in garbled english before activating a self-destruct 
device on its wrist when I actually quite liked that last kind of play by the uh, Predator because it's, it's that pretty cool scene where Dutch is kind of standing there and the Predator realises it's beaten and it doesn't have any anything else to do so it kind of looks to its wrist and you see that it hits like this sequence of buttons which Dutch doesn't really quite understand and then these weird numerals it, it, what looks like it could be a countdown Dutch realises what's happening and gets the hell out of there as fast as he practically can <laughs> <laughs> Meanwhile, yeah, it's actually a, a really great sequence when you think about it because he's taken the predator down using the log in the tree. Yeah, yeah, and he's about to go and smash its face in with a rock. Right? There's nothing more primal than that. That's caveman level stuff. And he doesn't do it. Instead, he just he seems intrigued by this creature there that's just bleeding to death. And it has a nuclear device attached to its arm. <laughs> You know, I know, my my nuclear weapon, it will rock any day. And he just activates that thing. He's like, holy crap, this thing is crazy. And then it starts, like, the Predator starts laughing, like, like overwhelmingly laughing, saying, like, even though you've won, you've totally lost, you know? Like, there's no way you can kind of get out of this. And, exactly. Um, you will not take me alive. Dutch flees and takes cover just before the self-destruct device explodes in a mushroom cloud. Dutch is actually the last man standing is it, and is actually picked up shortly afterwards by his commander, General Phillips, who we met earlier in the film that actually set them on the course for this mission. And uh, they actually also find Anna in the uh, helicopter as well. So she was able to get to the chopper in time. She mm. wasn't armed. No sport. Predator and didn't attack her. That's it. And that's kind of the end of the film. That like we we roll credits after that. And um, well, the... we do have to mention that this is like a real old school <laughs> thing oh, that they do with the credits. Of this. I I hated All this. All the actors turned a camera and smiled. <laughs> and I hated that. Did you? Man, I don't know. I, it's a, it's a wacky thing to do <laughs> at the end of this film. <laughs> and, been, over the years, I've kind of come to love it. I get it, dude. It's the eighties, man. They used to do this stuff all the time. They still do it now man like a feel-good film and they'll kind of have a card of each cast member doing a smile or something like that but in this film like I, I'm, I'm not too sure i needed it yeah <laughs> it was like i said just over the years i've just come to love it i don't know i kind of yeah i yeah, do yeah. i did forget to mention though that kevin peter hall played the predator mm -hmm. does make an appearance here at the end you know this whole time he's played the creature who wants to kill dutch he actually plays the pilot of the chopper who rescues dutch at the end so it's quite interesting i think kevin peter hall is again not really talked about that often but he plays a big role in this film and he does it really well he gives the predator kind of gravitas and a sense of presence about him in the same way that i, ca I can't remember the actor that did the alien and ridley scott's one but in a very kind of similar fashion fashion just gave a feeling that it was like this living breathing thing that was stalking them and was menacing and i realized there's a combination of things like whether it be stan winston's kind of design and various kind of other facets but kevin peter hall was the uh the man in the suit and he had to bring that character to life and he does it really well as i said to you before i think the predator looks great he feels great he's an iconic character definitely it's the interesting thing about this movie is there's just so many elements just came together and mm. worked you know and getting that secondary design on the predator by stan winston great you know kevin peter hall really brought it to life i really wanted to mention the music as well the theme yeah. of the predator is so good you know what man it's just, it's something i know this sounds terrible because i'm a music guy and i do another podcast called special features where we talk about music predominantly but i've never really considered myself to be a big music like score kind of guy like i've just i'm just never been that interested and i was watching this yesterday and the score really stood out for me like alan silvestri i'm um, fresh off doing back to the future a year or two earlier really hits it out of the park with this film from a score perspective it's iconic it's great it sets the mood it's over the top and kind of ridiculous but it never kind of ventures into the stupidity kind of territory like it's really solid work by him and something that he can definitely be proud of ratings recommend how about i let you go first with ratings recommends this week <laughs> Corey? i always go first <laughs> well as i said i mean i i watched this when i was a kid i've seen this so many times i just think this is a a, a downright excellent action film with that sci-fi bent that i love so much so i mean if alien is on my short list of 10 out of 10 films predator is also on my short list of 10 wow. out of 10 i love this movie 
Yeah, good. I'm, I'm kind of with you. I don't know if I love it quite as much as you. I really, really like it. I, as, as I said to you earlier on, I've seen this film a dozen times in 20 years and I'll probably watch it a dozen more over the next 20. It's one of those films that's kind of stayed with me. I do, however, think that the, the, the whiz-bang special effects that were so cutting edge for the time haven't aged quite as well as some other films. Like, like you know talking about alien in 79 like you can't tell the difference those effects are gold that could have been done yesterday this one however particularly the camouflage effect I, I remember when i was watching it, it always kind of took me out of the film a little bit but that's just me i don't think that takes away from how good this film is if i had to kind of give it a rating it's probably eight and a half duchess out of ten maybe nine probably nine duchess out of ten for me it's just some of those effects haven't aged perhaps as well as some other films of the time and don't waste your time get out and see it it's it, it's an excellent film mm. uh, okay so next week we'll be getting into predator 2 yes we jump ahead 1990 yeah we jump ahead with to three years into the future 1990 spoiler alert dutch is not in this next one but the guy from lethal weapon is but we'll get into that we'll get into week. that so that's it for this episode of the rewatch podcast keep up with listener interaction by joining our facebook page at facebook.com forward slash rewatch podcast and follow the show on twitter at rewatch pod and visit our web page rewatch podcast dot podomatic dot com yes and don't forget we will be keeping you apprised on our changeover at some point away mm. from podomatic probably but yeah that'll be happening in the next month or so when cool. i find time we do too many episodes I two know. a week at the moment i know i know but uh remember you can always write us an email record a voice message send it over to the rewatch podcast at gmail.com yep and if you've enjoyed the show we'd love to hear from you over on itunes a five-star review even a four-star review and write something nice mm -hmm. very much appreciated and you can always help support the rewatch podcast by heading over to patreon.com slash rewatch podcast and making a monthly contribution as little as a dollar helps uh, the gears keep turning any contribution is, is is very welcome anything it just helps keep the lights on and keeps things kind of churning along because as much as we love podcasting it's not free <laughs> you know <laughs> we wish it was but our whole back catalog is also up on youtube so you can just search the rewatch podcast and subscribe today well thank you for joining me for this discussion of predator nathan thank you cory I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to predator 2 and i will just say until next time you're one Ugly motherfucker. <laughs> Get to the chopper! <laughs>
quality shows we can create and we hope that you enjoy them. So head on over to patreon.com slash rewatch podcast to become one of our patrons and show your support for the rewatch podcast. And if we get enough patrons, we may even be able to produce exclusive content just for the supporters in the form of simply getting episodes before the main feed release or even bonus film discussion episodes as a thank you for your support. The website again is patreon.com slash rewatch podcast. Thanks, everyone.